quick review of lecture number nine. And we spoke about uh, the, uh, the structure of the uh, example of Appendix C, the 8-bit machine. And then we saw a number of uh, sample instructions of that particular machine. And we saw how we could, we could actually achieve a certain objective uh, of, um, of loading and adding two numbers and putting the result in memory using that, those instructions, okay? Um, another instruction that we looked at uh, briefly in passing was the jump instruction, okay? And I'm going to take a look, a close look at that uh, because that's an important instruction and that comprises a lot of code, uh, which is conditional code, okay? So um, we looked, at, we took a closer look at the CPU and we saw the, the program counter and the instruction register. Uh, just a thought over here, uh, which I perhaps didn't mention, is that if the uh, instruction itself is two byte, the program counter in this case would be one byte, uh, simply because the address itself is one byte, but the instruction register would be two bytes. Why is that? Because the actual instruction which gets loaded is actually two bytes in this case. Okay, just an additional point. <clears throat> we looked at the clock signal and the concept of, of different cycles, the machine cycle. Um, and then we looked at uh, how the cycle is repeated in terms of fetch, decode, and execute of instructions. And then we started looking at a simple analogy uh, in which we saw how um, the example of um, an activity in a laundry room could be uh, thought of to be able to understand how uh, the CPUs work, okay? <clears throat> so I'm going to come back to this analogy a bit later on, but before I do that, I want to give you a more concrete example of a machine code, okay? So um, here is another example, example two, and uh, we want to achieve the following objective. So um, let's say that we're given the following. So let's say we're given three inputs, n, x, and y. n is an integer greater than zero, and it's loaded up in location, memory location to zero, okay? Let's assume that. Uh, we also assume that x is an integer and it's located in memory location to one, okay? So this is again an example using the same appendix C machine of BNB. Uh, and we're going to try to see how we can implement this machine code. Um, and thirdly, Y is an integer in memory location two, two, okay? So when I'm saying uh, these are contiguous memory locations, so clearly these are one byte integers, okay? And our simple objective is to be able to, con to uh, implement the following loop following iterative loop. So what we want to do is for i in range zero comma n, and this is sort of a Python statement, we want to, we want to uh, calculate x is equal to x plus y, okay? Fairly straightforward. Um, and if you look at the Python code, it might look something like this. We declaring n is equal to three, for example, initially making x is equal to five, y is equal to two. And this uh, block of code over here, which is simply two lines for i is equal to, uh, for i in range zero comma n we want to do x is equal to x plus y. We're not going to do this print statement, but we're simply going to try to implement this blue box inside our machine code. Okay, so um, let's see how we can do that. And I will again request uh, students of class. I believe five triple seven uh, is the designated class today. So I would prefer if they answer the questions first. So. Um, Let's take a look at how we'd actually write this uh, machine code, okay? And we're going to use the following uh, operations or following instructions that are already, we've already seen these. We're going to use a load, okay? Uh, we're going to use two types of loads. One is an indirect load in which you actually take in the contents of the location. And the other load actually uh, loads a particular memory pattern, right? You can actually, load a particular value, for example. Then this is a store, which is doing the, the reverse. Um, this is an add operation, 
this is a jump operation, and this is a halt operation. Okay, so you've seen all of these. So now let's see how we can implement this. So uh, this is where now I need your help. So um, let's assume uh, that we have this data stored. Okay, so this is already stored in memory. So we said that n is an integer which is stored in location two zero. Uh, X is stored in location 21 and Y is stored in location 22. And let's assume that these are the initial values just for reference purposes. So N, X, and Y are here. Now, can somebody uh, suggest how should we go about writing this code? Uh, we want to implement for I in range zero comma N and we want to do X is equal to X plus Y and we need to use these operations above here, okay? So um, go ahead, give me your suggestions. How sir, this is Ali. Ji. Sir, this is Ali Iqbal. Uh, I think uh, code should be five, zero, two, one. Okay, so um, you're going into the exact code right now, but uh, let's, Let's go back into our algorithms structure, okay? Remember when we started off the course, we said uh, we started at the, at the top level, at the high level. So uh, think about the structure of the algorithm first and then start coding, okay? So I don't want you to start coding immediately. I want you to tell me what should be the structure of this code, okay? In terms of the flow chart, for example, uh, how should we, what should be the main blocks of this code? Main one, two, or three blocks of this code. Any thoughts? So again, Ali, you can go ahead, but uh, don't tell me the details right now. Tell me the big picture first. And how would you go about it? What, so be, we'll, what would be your strategy? We'll yeah. execute the fifth opcode, I think. Fifth opcode and uh, add the bit patterns and let the, that is written there, S and T. So we okay. will add bit patterns in 21 and 22, address 21 and 22. Okay. So that could I be one it. way that you could simply, um, what uh, Ali I think is suggesting is that the entire algorithm could be sort of simplified into a single uh, instruction and that uh, and all it's going to do is it's going to take the registers S and T and it's going to add them together. But remember this is a more complex algorithm, okay? It's not just adding two numbers, it's saying that you want to go in the range zero comma N. Okay, so it has to be an iterative algorithm. Um, think about uh, what are the different operations that we're going to use in this? Uh, what are the different instructions? Are we going to use, uh, for example, a very critical uh, instruction is, are we going to have to use the jump instruction? Okay, can somebody answer that? Uh, do we need to use the jump instruction at any point in this? Sheikh Zia Said. Ji Sheikh Zia Said. Um, sir, yes, we have used a jump instruction because um, there is a condition statement that we have to stay in the range of zero to n minus one. Right. So I okay. So very good. So uh, as Zia has just mentioned that we will have to use a jump instruction. So now let's sort of focus for a few minutes on the jump instruction itself because it's kind of complicated. It says jump to the instruction located in a memory cell at a certain address if the bit pattern in register R is equal to the bit pattern in register zero, okay? So for example, uh, we, take, we take a particular register and we say if the contents of that register are equal to the contents of register zero, then we're going to jump to memory location X, Y, okay? So how would we um, use this jump instruction to implement this iterative, um, uh, iterative uh, algorithm. How could we use that? Sir, Musab. Ji, Musab. Iqbal. Um, sir, we will load the uh, zero, 00 instruction. We will load uh, n. We load n? Okay. Then we will... where, where do we load n yes. into? Uh, in address zero, 00. So, in register zero, 00. Okay, that's so, much better. So, what you're saying is, Let's start loading up the, the values. So in R0, we're going to load up N, okay? And why are you selecting R0 for N? 
so that we can then use the jump function. Uh, jump okay, function. excellent. So you see, um, uh, this is a very good suggestion. Basically, what has been suggested is that because we have to compare the value of a register to R0, and remember that the comparison will imply that we're looking at a limiting value, okay? So we want to make sure that um, some value i uh, will initially perhaps go from 0, 1, 2, and go all the way up to the n. So we need to compare the value of i, which will presumably be in some register, with the value of n, with the value of register 0. So, what, so a good idea is that we put the value of n in register 0, okay? So I hope that uh, people are able to follow this uh, uh, good suggestion. So we load up R0 into, we load up N into R0, okay? Now, what other registers uh, do we need to use? Remember, everything that we're going to do is going to be based on registers. So um, what other values, uh, we've already loaded up uh, value N, uh, what else do we need to load into registers? Okay, so this is kind Sir, of mask Kareem. Yeah, mask. So we would need to load X as well because it okay. says it'll leave the result in register R. Okay, so let's load up X into R1. Okay, let's similarly go on. Let's load up Y into R2. Okay, you'll also need to have a variable I, which will change. So let's assume that R I is loaded into, into register 3. <clears throat> these are the variables that we need to do comparisons with, right? So everything that we're going to be working with, it has to be in registers. That, that's like your desk space, okay? So we're going to be comparing with those. So, uh, so can people help me uh, load these values up uh, with instructions? Now we have the detailed instructions, let's do that. What's the first instruction going to be? Sir, Musab, uh, yeah, Musab. one, zero. 1020. 1020. Very good. So basically, you're loading up. So I'm going to write it in a shorthand notation and I'm going to show this as I'm uh, putting into R0 the contents of uh, the value n. Okay. <clears throat> so basically, this uh, is same notation. This arrow over here simply means that the n value is copied into register R0. Okay. The next address will clearly be 02. Uh, similarly, we're going to load into 121. Okay. So this. Why not 01? Gee, sorry, there was a question. So why load it into 02? Why not 01? Okay. So are you referring to this value over here? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the, remember this, in, this uh, instruction is actually two bytes long, okay? So zero, zero, so one zero is going to be in location zero, zero. We covered this last time. And two zero, the next byte is going to be in, in address location zero one, okay? That's why uh, we're jumping directly to zero two. Okay, this was covered in the last uh, lecture if you review. Okay. okay. So um, the next address would be 04, and there we can load up our, uh, we're going to load up Y over here. So this would clearly be, we're going to be using the opcode one, and we're going to do one, two, and we're going to load up the location to two over here, because that corresponds to Y, okay? So I hope this is clear so far. Okay, so zero four. Now, can somebody tell me the next one? Uh, this is the third uh, instruction, which says uh, we want to load up I into R3. Okay, how should we do that? Now, I is not given over here. So we have to start I from zero, right? Yeah. Mas Karim. Yeah, G Mas. Go ahead. So what should be the instruction? Yeah, so somebody give me the, the solution for this. What, which um, opcode are we going to use? 
Now remember, we have two load commands. One is saying that we load the contents of a memory, and the other is saying that we load a bit pattern, okay, into a register. Right. So, so do we need to load a bit pattern into register three? The initial value, perhaps, of i. Say so, yes. We could just write zero zero zero. So what what would be the actual opcode? The the complete instruction over here. Sir, sir, I think it will be two three zero zero. Two three zero zero. Okay, very good, Abdullah. So uh, this is two three zero zero. What, what th that is going to do is going to use opcode number two, which says load into register R, which is register three, and is going to load the bit pattern zero zero. Okay. So basically, I is equal to zero is being loaded into. We're setting the initial value of I to be zero, and we're loading that into register three. Okay, and this is something that we'll have to continuously increment. Okay. So, now, so why is how do we set I equals zero? Like, isn't address zero zero n? Okay, so remember, you're getting confused between opcode two and opcode one. Okay. So opcode two over here says that load the register R with the bit pattern X Y, as opposed to with the bit pattern found in the memory cell whose address is X Y. Okay, huge difference between these two. One is saying one is an indirect uh, command. The first three commands are saying load the address, load the contents of two zero. Okay, so it would go to the content two go to the address two zero and get the contents of that and load that. Okay. And the content would be a variable, which we don't know. In this case, it happens to be zero three. Zero opcode number two is saying, um, put the number zero zero into register three, not the contents of zero zero, but the number zero. zero. Okay. So I hope that is clear. Hello, sir. Uh, yeah. Is, is that like, sorry, is that like uh, put the variable into register three? Uh, which one? The, the opcode one? Put variable one? I into register three. Which, which opcode? Opcode one or two? For the second opcode, two opcode. No, the opcode one is like that. Okay. Opcode two is simply putting a specific value which you're specifying over here. Okay. So this here is a bit pattern. Zero zero is a bit pattern, which is simply eight zeros, right? Zero zero is simply zero 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 zero. Okay. So this is one byte, and it's going to load the value zero into the location into register three. Okay. So all it's doing but is. But won't the value of i be incremented? It has to be incre incremented. Absolutely right. But how are we going to do that? That's the next question. How do you think we're going Musab. to do that? Sir Musab. Ji, Musab. Yes, I have an idea uh, yeah. for the incrementation. Yeah. We'll create another register, register four, which will be two, four, zero, one. And then uh, after that, every, uh, every register we will add, uh, we'll use the add function to add register three and uh, register four. And the answer we get from that, we add register four to that. Okay. So it will add, add one. Excellent, excellent. So uh, I think Musab has read my mind. Uh, basically, what he's suggesting is that now we need to increment the this register three, which is going to represent i. Okay. Now we're going to be incremented by one. Now the issue is that how do we increment it by one? There's no function. There's no operation over here which says increment a register by one. Okay. All it does say is that you can add two registers together, s and t and you can put the result into another register. So what he's suggesting is that let's put, take another register, register four, and we'll simply make that equal to one, the number one. And then what we'll do is whenever we want to increment uh, the register three by one, we're going to take R4 and add it to R3. Okay, that seems to be a brilliant idea. So let's go ahead with that. Um, what's the next uh, address going to be? Where is that going to be located? You've got zero eight. Any thoughts? Does this seem right? Hmm? 
No? Yes? No, that's not right. Uh, do you remember that this is all in hexadecimal? So after eight comes nine and after nine comes eight. Okay, so zero A. Uh, so in zero A, now what do we need to do? So we sort of initialized or all our values. Okay, we've got these initializations done. Now can we start doing the actual iterative algorithm? Okay, so here's the iterative algorithm that perhaps we can start attempting to do that. Okay, so what should be the first um, instruction uh, in this iteration? What should we do first? Same, same uh, set. Uh, set. We'll do five, five, three, four. Okay, let's take a look at what Musab is suggesting. He's saying that uh, take um, the register five, five, three, four. So basically, what you're saying is um, take uh, put in register five the contents of R3 plus R4. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. Okay. Now, um, okay, we could do that. Um, why are you using an additional register? This is basically what this is doing is it's taking R3 is I and I4. So, so you in, so you putting I plus one and you're putting into another register. Why are you two using another register, R5? So we can use the same one also and just update the value. Can we do that? Uh, say that again. Your voice was kind of muffled, Heather. Can you say that again? Uh, sir, can, can we like update the value and register 2300? So we can update the, the register value in, uh, in R3. So, so I, you don't need to use another register. Sort of, you, you basically what you're trying to do is you're doing I plus plus, right? You're incrementing the value of I. So why use another register when you could simply use the same register? So you could do R3, I is equal to I plus R4, okay? So small change over here, five, three, three, four, okay? So uh, do you agree with that? We could simply take the value of, register three, add a number one, and you put that back into R3. That's totally fine, okay? There's no way, no way in this command does it say R has to be different from S and T, okay? <clears throat> We're done with that, we've incremented I. Uh, let's go to the next instruction, that will be A, B, C, zero, C. Now what do we need to do? Any thoughts? You incremented sir, I, okay. yeah. So we will compare uh, the I value with the N value. So uh, the code will be B and uh, I guess we have to make the new register or, and then three and zero. So let's say, uh, so what's the total code B30? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but I'm not sure if we have to make another register or not. Or okay. it's so like so let's, try, let's try to do that. So what is being said is that we're trying to compare. We're saying jump if um, something is, is, if register three is equal to N. Basically, that's what you're saying, right? So. We're saying that uh, if, um, we're going to compare register three, which is three, and then um, we're going to, this is going to be the location. We don't have to specify register zero because that's understood. It's always going to compare it with register zero, okay? So B3 is going to say, compare the value of register three, which is I, very good, with the register zero with N. And if that is true, if they're equal, then jump to a particular memory location, okay? Now, what mem memory location should we jump to? If this Sir, is equal. Sir, 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 Sir. Sir, we will create a halt execution, C000, and we will refer this to that. Okay, so let's Sir, say, Sir. Okay, just a minute. Uh, so the suggestion was that we have a halt statement somewhere, which is going to be C000 which is basically where we want to finish the command, the code, right? 
And now I'm going to use something called labels, okay? Because we don't really know what the address is yet. Because unless we fill out this portion, we don't really know what address. So let's call this label one, okay? So this is a particular hypothetical location in memory. So you're saying that jump to L1 if these two are equal, okay? Sounds, sounds reasonable. There was another question. Another comment. Nidal here. Ji, Nidal. So I wanted to ask that, should we do the sum instruction before the I increment? Mm. Very good, very good. So we, we sort of jumping ahead. So let's leave this for, for later. Let's put this sum over here. 0, 3, B, 3, L, 1. And uh, sorry. They said before even incrementing the value of I. Okay. So you're suggesting that we should, um, uh, we should actually, your suggestion was to do this operation as x is equal to x plus y. Is that what you suggested? Exactly, sir. Okay. So let's do x is equal to x plus y. Okay. So before even incrementing the value of i. Okay, so so let, let's, uh, this code is going to bit, get a bit jumbled up, but let's put all the pieces together and then see how we can uh, sort it out. Let, let me put it over here. So how would we do x is equal to x plus y? Sir Musab. G Musab. Can somebody else also try? I don't want just, you know, a few people answering all the questions. Can we have some new people trying to answer? How would we do x is equal to x plus y? Now remember, x is in location. X has been uploaded to register R1, and y is in register R2. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to update x with the value of x plus y. What we're basically trying to do. Uh, five, one, uh, two. Five one one double one two. Five double one two. Let's see what that does. Five is an addition. It says take the content of one and two and put it into one. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's right. So I had made a mistake over here. This is supposed to be R1 plus R2. Okay, excellent. So five one one two uh, would be able to do this addition. Okay. <clears throat> now um the question is whether we want to do the addition first or we want to do uh, the incrementation first. Well, it could be either one, okay? But but um, I think you're getting the general Nidal idea. Uh, Gene, Nidal. Sir, if we do the incrementation first, then the program won't run at i is equals to zero. It will start with i is equals to one. Yeah, yes, so, so there's some boundary conditions that you have to worry about. But I think broadly speaking, you guys are getting the idea, the, the intricacies of this algorithm. And um, if you try to write this out the first time around, it may not work, okay? So you have to modify it, you, you get the basic steps in. And then the most important thing is the, uh, how do you actually um, stop this, okay? So we've got, we had a suggestion over here that we're going to stop um, if i is equal to n. Okay, and then we're going to jump to, to L1. Okay, so this is basically saying if I is equal to um, N, which is basically register zero, then jump to L1. Okay, so, so far so good. Uh, let's just uh, not worry about these two right now. We'll come back to this later on. But what if this is not? So this is an if condition, right? If then else, remember. If this is true, then we do this. What if it is not true, then what do we do? So um, we have to iterate, right? How do we iterate? We need to go through a loop. Right, and where does the beginning of where does the loop begin? It clearly it doesn't begin. These are some of the initialization parts, right? All the way up till here was essentially initialization. So where does the loop begin? At what address does the loop begin? 
this is Amar. It begins at zero a. Yeah, very good. So we basically need to have some kind of a. We need to have a jump to. Jump to, uh, location zero a. Okay. Now, um, how do we enforce a jump to? Okay, we only have a conditional jump. We don't have, um, uh, you know, a non-conditional jump. So is there some way that we can have a non-conditional jump? In other words, you're forcing the program because the condition came in over here. If this condition was true, we would basically jump to this location and end the program, which is fine. Okay. But if this was not true, then we need to go back over here. Okay. How do we do that? Um, any, any thoughts? G -Bilal. We will put uh, a statement that is always true for the program. Then after that, we'll put another jump statement. Okay. Like okay. i is greater than zero. All right. But you see this jump, the, the only way that this jump con condition works is that it compares a register with register zero. And if these two are equal, then it will jump to the location that you specify. Sir, Maaz Kareem. Yeah, Maaz. Sir, after the halt condition, we will make a new register with the value of n. And then we will compare n to register zero, which will always be n. And that condition will always be true. Okay. So, um, but why are you doing, why are you doing this after the halt? Okay, let's do this over here. I meant after the condition where you're comparing okay. for the halt. Yeah, yeah for the halt, right. So at this location, so let's keep going. This is zero A, this is zero C, this is zero C, D, E, zero E. And this would be um, E, F, and then this would be one zero. Okay. So at one zero, we want to have a condition, which I think what was suggested, and if not, then this is my suggestion. We simply compare R0 with R0. That's always going to be true, right? How are we going to do that? B, compare, zero, up to G. Uh, B0, L1. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So B0, not L1, but let's say L2. And let's say this is uh, address L2. Okay. So B0 L2 will simply do a forceful jump. It'll say, is zero register zero equal to register zero? If that is true, then jump to L2. So L1 and L2. So L1 and L2 are labels. They're not really part of the, the actual machine code. They're simply symbols that I'm using as a, on a temporary basis for writing the code, okay? So I'm referring to L2 as the, L2 is basically equal to zero A, okay? So you could simply put zero A over here, okay? That would be the same thing. But uh, sometimes we need to have labels because as temporary symbols, uh, because we don't really know what, what, the, uh, uh, what the location of this address will be because we're writing the intermediate code. Okay, because we don't know if this will end over here. Okay, but it seems like this is the last line, and this would most likely be at one, two. Okay, so you could say that this is one, zero, and one, two, and L1 would be one, two. Okay, so, um, so does this seem to be a reasonable code? Are we, um, have we done everything that we needed to? Almost everything besides a couple of these statements which need to be figured out. There's something that we haven't done. We've said X is equal to X plus Y. Now, X right now is simply a register value, but actually X is supposed to be in memory location 21. Have we updated the memory location 21? And should we? Sir, we have to write. Yeah. So uh, how, what should we do that? And where should we do that? So practically there could be a couple of places you could do that. You could do that um, either before the halt, for example. So instead of halt over here, you would have 
let's say L1, 1, 2 over here. And instead of directly going to a halt, you first save X gets register R1, okay? Uh, X gets register R1 because basically saving the value. Initially, we loaded X into R1. Now we're doing the opposite. And how would we do the opposite? What would be the instruction for that? Anybody? What would be the instruction to save the register R1 to the memory location X? Set T1, T1. Sorry? Abdullah. Three, three, one, two, one. Let's see if that is. It would store register one into location 21. Perfect. Okay. So we could have um, the halt L1 at location this address. Okay. So this is what the L1 would be. And before we actually halt, we save R1 to X and then we halt. Okay. So uh, this is pretty much the, the code that I had actually written out. And if you compare these two codes, then what you'll see is that uh, it's almost the same. We were loading up different values. Um, up till here, it's exactly the same. Uh, the small differences that I've, I've done is that first I do the comparison. Okay. The first thing that I'm doing is I'm doing the comparison and then jump into L1. If uh, you've already, and you'll notice that this actually does the boundary condition, boundary cases correctly. Okay. And then we're doing something similar to what's already been discussed. We incremented I, we set X is equal to X plus Y. And then we did a comparison of R0 is equal to R0 and we jumped to L2. So these are the two memory locations that I used initially. Okay. And I said L1 over here. This simply helps you in writing the code. L2 over here. And then later on, what you can do is once you've actually determined the, because you can't have spaces in between. Okay. So this entire piece of code has to be contiguous until you get to a halt. Right. Or unless you have forced jumps in which you make sure that uh, you don't necessarily go to the next location memory. Um, of course, you could have space in between your, your data. This is your data and your program code. So your code is actually over here. So there could be some space in between because once your program halts over here, uh, this portion is no longer executed. So you're not going to run into any kind of problem. So um, is everybody clear on this particular example? Uh, if not, this is the time to ask. Sir, Usman, I have a question. Ji. Sir, uh, for, uh, the, I cannot understand what have you done in table one when you have initialized R1 to X. Okay, in, in location L1, basically what we've done is we've um, you've taken the value of R1, okay? which was basically initially loaded with the value of X. Now, all of this manipulation that we're doing, we're simply working with the registers. We're not really look at working with the actual memory location because we, we don't have to work with the memory location. That's slow, okay? So what all we're doing is in, while the code is running, we're simply working with, the mem with R1 as the X value. And we're working with these, we, with these values, R0, R1, R2, R3, and R4, okay? Once we're done with the entire uh, code and we completed this, at the end, we want to write back the value because the registers is not the final location. We need to specify the value. We need to save X, uh, the, the register R1, back into this memory location, okay? So what this command does is it does this function, store the bit pattern found in register R, into the memory whose address is given by x, y, okay? So what we're doing is we're storing the register R1 into memory location R21, y21, because 21 was the location where R1 was initially loaded from, okay? Okay, one. sir, thank you. Okay. So, sir, uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, if we have a longer code, how would we add two registers that have like, 2 JSSA, how do we add register 12 
and 14 because we can only write a four digit code right so if you want to add r12 plus r14 can somebody tell me how this would be done Can somebody help us over oh, yeah, here? How could this be done? It's an interesting question because uh, the gentleman is getting confused with the fact that this seems to be two digits, right? And uh, all, maybe you would see. Yeah, exactly. Because R12, this is hex code, remember? Okay. And this number would simply be uh, 101112. This would be A, B, and C. So this would be RC. Okay, so you'd basically specify C over here. So if you wanted to do this operation, this is C, this is D, and this is, sorry, this is D and this is E, okay? So what you would do is you'd use opcode number five, five, D, C, E, okay? So this would take register E, Add that to register C and put the result in register D. Okay. This is where your hex code comes in. I hope uh, that is clear. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, and so what if, uh, so what if the number is larger than 16? So it's larger than the uh, hex code. Okay. Then, then you have a problem because if you remember um, the, the op the architecture that we're using, it's only got 16 registers, okay? So we're using a specific architecture and it starts off by saying that there are only 16 registers. If you had more than 16 registers, you would have to change the entire architecture of your instruction code. Okay, that's a good question, but you have to go back to the basics. This is where we started from. And this can only accommodate uh, this can only accommodate 16 registers. Why is that? Because we decided that the opcode would, uh, the operands, the opcode and the operands all were designed such that you could only address four bit. Um, a nibble would be sufficient to be able to address the register. Okay. Sir, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm asking the. Uh, so, okay, I'm not clear what your question is. Maybe you can type it out because there's too much uh, audio feedback from the auditorium. If you have added, written that question, let me look at the chat window. Um, there's some pending questions. Uh, why do you use 3121 as X is globally defined, the value won't be updated or overrated for, why do you use 3121 as X is globally defined, the value won't be updated or overwritten as for loop is blocked. Okay, so I think you're referring to concepts which we haven't studied yet. Maybe uh, this will come in later on, okay. Uh, was there a more uh, a question that I can answer? Uh, the question, do you expect us to remember any opcode? No, I don't expect you. If I give you these questions in the examination, I will give you, uh, for example, I could give you this entire, all these opcodes, op okay? And then I'll ask you to write some code. So you don't have to memorize anything, but you do have to understand the concepts behind these operations. Okay. Sir, Maaz Kareem. Ji, Maaz. Sir, over here, when we halt, will it exit the entire program? Because we had a print statement after this. Okay, so as I said earlier, I'm not uh, doing the print portion. I'm simply going to implement up to this code. So, um, we're not going to implement the print because that's kind of beyond the scope of this of these instructions. There's no instruction over here which actually prints something, okay? And we're going to assume that once it's halted, that's the end, okay? That's uh, the end of the of the program 
It's not going to execute anything anymore. It's very simplistic because um, we're not really talking about a complete computer, okay? Uh, and when we talk about operating systems later on, then you'll realize that this is a very small component of the big picture, okay? But if you understand this, then you'll be able to understand the bigger picture once you get to it, okay? So uh, let's go on. Now, we had a simple analogy, and I started this analogy to explain another concept that I will now introduce. So here was the analogy, which in which basically what I said was that uh, you have a laundry room, and here you're putting in uh, loads of laundry, and each one of those is taking 20 minutes. So you, put, you have a washer, you have a dryer, and then you're folding operation, right? And uh, when you put in a single load of wash uh, of laundry, it first goes into the washing machine, then it goes into the dryer, and then it's folded up, and each one takes 20 minutes. So this can be thought of as each one of these is a 20 minute cycle, okay? So this takes one hour, one hour, and then the second laundry load, okay, comes in, that takes another hour, and a third laundry load comes in, and that takes another hour, okay? So in this example, you were taking three hours to load three laundries, to get three laundries through the laundry room, okay? But um, you can obviously see that there is a problem here. The problem is that um, when the washer is being used, the dryer is, is, going, is being wasted, okay? This is an, a resource which is, not, which is not being utilized. And so is the space over here for folding, okay? Somebody could have been folding their clothes uh, if you were intelligent about it, or somebody else could, be, could have been using the dryer. So how can we improve this situation? Any thoughts? If you wanted to get the maximum amount of utilization of the laundry room with as many laundry loads going through it, how could we simply improve the operation? Sir, what's up? Yeah, what's up? So we could simultaneously do some of the cycles like while the first uh, drying is happening, we can start the second washing. Very good. So what's being suggested is that instead of doing this so much later, okay, as soon as the first cycle is done and now the dryer is being used, so now clearly in the next 20 minutes, the, the position is that the first washing, the load one, is, is over here, is in the dryer, okay? So the washing machine is empty. So the second load could come over here, all right? And in the third 20 minutes, when the, the first load go, it goes into the folding table, then what you could do is um, have the second load go into the dryer, okay? And since the washing machine is now free, you could have the third load come in over here and use the washing machine, okay? So um, you can see that basically what we're doing is you have uh, W1 and then dryer one and F1 and then W2, dryer two, F2, W3, dryer three, F3 and so on. Okay, so this is what this is making sure is that at any given time, especially after the first two cycles, then all three of the resources are being fully utilized. Okay, so at in, in the third 20 minutes, the, um, the first laundry will be over here. Okay, the second one will be over here and the third one will be over here. So you can clearly see that we have this, the concept behind this is something called pipelining. Okay. And this is used in CPUs to improve the speed. Now, there are a couple of terms that I'm going to introduce over here. There's something called latency, and there's something called throughput. Okay. Now, latest, latency means how much time does it take for the first laundry load or the first instruction to get through the system, okay? Now, what's the, the latency for each one of these? How much time does a particular 
laundry load get, take to get through the system? Is that, is that going to take 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes? So how long does this, uh, this load get to? Uh, Ryan, uh, 20 minutes. So the latency for it to get through the entire laundry, okay? To, through the entire laundry room. So the washing, drying, and, and folding cycle, all three cycles. 60 minutes. Oh, it's 60 minutes. It's 60. Okay? So the latency is going to be 60 minutes. But once the system is full, okay, what's the throughput going to be? The throughput is basically saying, what is the rate at which things are coming out? Okay. So how, how quickly will the laundry is once this is full and you're going full, uh, full throttle, so to speak, W4, um, dryer four, folding four, and so on. Then um, at this point, this guy, this comes out. Then in the next 20 minutes, another load comes out. And the next 20 minutes, another load comes out. And you can see that every 20 minutes, um, a laundry is being completed, okay? So that's the throughput. And what would the, how would you determine the throughput? How would you state the throughput as? So latency can be thought of as in terms of time, right? What is the units for throughput? So is it like frequency? Uh, frequency is one upon second. Yeah, sort of that. Yeah. So very good. It would be sort of like frequency. So in hertz. Okay? In hertz. Okay. So um, in hertz. And um, another simpler way to put it is how would you put it if you're describing this to your mom? Okay. What's the throughput? She won't understand hertz. Okay. Let's assume that. Or your grandmother. How would you explain the throughput of this laundry, uh, of this laundry room in terms of very simple terms? Hey, Ryan, uh, the yeah. amount it takes, uh, and the time it takes for one uh, laundry to get completed? The time it takes for one laundry to get completed. Is that in units of time? So we um, said so throughput is, is, is one upon time. So it's not time. Gee. Sir, so we could say three cycles per hour. Three loads per hour. Okay. So that it has the right units. Okay. So this is basically per hour. This is saying that in one hour, I can get three lo loads of laundry through the system. Okay. So that's the right answer. Or you could simply say as one load every 20 minutes. Okay, a simpler way to put it, same thing, okay? But once one load, one unit every 20 minutes, okay? So that, so you can see, you, you can see that the units of throughput and latency are very different. And we'll come across this again when we go into data communication later on in this course. Uh, question. So could you please explain latency again? Okay, so the latency is simply the time. So, um, if you think about it, the amount of time it takes for this one load to go through input and output, okay? So the time it takes for this guy to go in and come out, okay? Time taken from this chap to go in and out, okay? Time taken for this third to go in and out. So you can see that each one of these is one hour, is exactly one hour. So this is the latency or the delay. So it's in, a, in other words, it's like saying, uh, you give your get, you give your clothes to laundry. How long will it take to get get it back? You don't really care about the throughput. All you care is I'm in an urgency. I need to get my clothes ready. How long is it going to take? All right. So that's latency. Very simple. It's going to take an hour. Throughput, on the other hand, is sort of saying that how efficient is the laundry system? Okay. Uh, how much money can that laund can the laundromat earn? Because if it's only taking uh, one laundry, uh, and obviously there's a cost associated there. He's probably earning some money. So if he's only doing one uh, laundry per hour, he's not going to be earning much, okay? If he can do three per hour, he's going to be earning three times as much, okay? Because the resources are fixed. So in a sense, uh, these are two different objectives. One is from the user's point of view, the latency, and the throughput can be thought of as the uh, the, the objective from the laundromat owner's point of view, okay? So I hope you've understood these two terms, latency and throughput. Um, let's keep going. And now let's take a look at 
Uh, and this was basically what I, we've already talked about. Now the latency, um, um, the, the latency. Now notice that uh, just one point over here, that the latency is still one hour. Even though you've done the pipelining, okay? So if you, if you don't have pipelining, and you do have to pipelining. Let's compare these two. So what is the latency over here? And what is the throughput? I'm going to use this notation for the throughput. So latency over here, if you notice, is still 16 minutes. The throughput is one load per hour, per hour. okay? But if you have a pipelining, the latency is still the same, still 60 minutes, okay? but the throughput has increased now from one per hour to three loads per hour, okay? So these are fine points to be able to understand the difference between a pipelined architecture versus a non-pipelined architecture, okay? So let's, uh, if that is clear, let's go on and now take a look at an actual CPU. So in the CPU, let's assume that you have different instructions. We spoke about the different instruction cycles this was the instruction fetch, then the instruction decode, and then the execute. So internally, what happens is that when you do an instruction fetch, you basically fetch the instruction from memory and you put it inside the instruction register, right? And then remember the control unit comes in and it decodes the instruction, right? And then it tells the ALU how to process this. And that's the execution cycle and then the output comes in. So if you're adding two numbers, for example, this will say, add the two numbers in registers, the control unit is doing, going to do something fancy, and then it's going to tell the, the ALU to add these two numbers instead of subtracting or doing something else. Now notice that this is sort of similar to the laundromat, okay? In which you have three resources, and the, while the instruction is being fetched from memory into the instruction register, the control unit is idle, and the ALU is idle, okay? Um, and so you could simply use the same concept over here and you could use the following uh, technique is that instead of having uh, the first instruction come in and then get decoded and then executed and then the second instruction coming in being fetched from memory, uh, decoded, executed, and then the third instruction coming in and so on, all you need to do is move these up. Why, you can, why can you do that? Simply because you're using the same concept. So let's do this. Uh, in the second clock cycle, we, in the first clock cycle, we have fetched the first instruction. In the second clock cycle, we're going to decode this. But now what we're going to do is we're going to fetch the second instruction, okay? In the third clock cycle, we're going to now execute the instruction. The instruction goes from here to the control unit, to the ALU, okay? We're going to execute the first instruction. At the same time, we can now decode the second instruction. And now we can also, at the same time, fetch the third instruction, okay? So I hope you get the, the general idea of what we're doing, very similar to the laundromat example, and so on. So let's assume that each one of them takes one nanosecond, okay? That means that this is a one gigahertz machine. Takes one nanosecond for each clock cycle. So what would be the latency for, for to get an instruction completed through this whole thing? Uh, three nanoseconds, Ryan. This would be three nanoseconds. And what would be the throughput in this case in the pipeline architecture? One nanosecond. Uh, one nanosecond. Um, doesn't have the right unit. Three, uh, three cycles per, uh, what do you say? Three nanoseconds. Oh, wait, one, one, one cycle per three. No, let's get the units correct. The throughput, what would the throughput be? How you per hour, right? One per nanosecond. Yeah, so it would be one instruction, one instruction, per nanosecond, okay? Or you could say three instructions in three nanoseconds. But basically what we're saying is that uh, after every nanosecond, one instruction is going to get completed. This is the first instruction, the second instruction, 
the third instruction. So basically, this means that the CPU is, is being used properly. Okay, each one of the different pieces of hardware inside the CPU are being fully utilized. Okay, and you don't have any idle resources. Okay. So that's the pipeline architecture. And this is what it's going to look like. If you think about it, it's simply, I've simply added more instructions. As you can see, that's how it's going forward, okay? Now, if you've understood this, uh, now the next question is, what kind of issues could you have? So let's say that um, this, this uh, structure is working fine, but can somebody think of any issues that you could come up? And let's go back to our laundromat and think of what um, are the kinds of problems that could happen over here. Sir, extreme use ho jayega. Extreme use ho jayega, yeah. So that's, that's maybe good and bad because what you're saying is that the dryer is going to be continuously used, the washing machine, it's not going to get time to sort of, you know... Uh, Sir, Akip. Ji, Akip. Sir, if there is a problem with one cycle, either with washing, drying, or folding, so the whole pipeline will be disturbed. Okay, very good. So those are good suggestions. Uh, both of those are valid suggestions. Uh, the first suggestion was that you you overusing the system, okay? And whenever you're overusing the system, obviously there's a chance of breakdown. The second issue is has been raised is that there seems to be um, a series of activities and it seems like any one of them could be a bottleneck. But then I could argue that if you're comparing pipelining versus non-pipelining regarding the second point, then even in the non-pipeline architecture, if any one of those machines went bad, you would still have a bottleneck. So pipelining uh, is the first suggestion seemed valid, but the second suggestion I wouldn't agree with. Okay, any other problems that you could have? What other potential problems, or or maybe this is too, too uh, sir, if two instructions are connected like uh, uh, with one another, not in this kit, but if we take another like in programming or okay. one value which is used in uh, after some of the statements. So okay, very good. Uh, let, let's stick to the laundry example. What do you mean by two? Uh, can you give me an example using the laundromat? Uh, when could you have that problem? If two instructions you're saying basically are connected to each other, instructions over here are loads of laundry, right? How could loads of laundry, two laundries be connected to each other? Can you think of that? People have done their laundries themselves would know. This is a realistic situation. So what are we doing here? Basically what we're saying is that, um, we, we're pushing the laundries through, but what is being suggested is that maybe uh, this second laundry actually is connected to the first laundry. Can you think of an example where this would be true? When you have too much laundry. Mm. Well, this is an example of too much laundry already. You know, you've got different laundries. But when would, let's say, the output of the dryer be linked to the second washing, to the second load that's coming in? Can you think of so that? Maybe. Uh, we could say both of them are connected to the same power source. So there's more load in the power source. Okay, you're going in a slightly different direction. You're basically saying that, uh, yeah, because they're all connected and because you're using them simultaneously, then you could have, that's a, that, that's a good point. So you could have some common resource that is common to both of these and that, that could be overloaded because now, now we're using them both at the same time. That's a very, very uh, interesting con uh, con uh, note and keep that for later on, okay? This will come in handy later on. But right now, what we're trying to refer to, I think the second suggestion was that of, um, of the data itself. The data, this is called data dependency, okay? Um, what is being referred to is data dependency. In other words, these two datas, these two loads are actually connected to each other. And let me give you an example of that. 
suppose that um, as you're going through this, um, I'm going to mute everybody because the class party is there. I didn't give you a question. I'm going to forget. I'm going to forget. I'm going to forget. Okay. Muting people. Um, so let's assume that um, as the first uh, laundry goes through and you come out over here and then you realize that this, uh, as you're folding it, you realize that the clothes didn't really get uh, properly washed, okay? And you're in a hurry. You want to get, make sure that they're properly washed. So you actually want to put this uh, laundry output back into the washer. Okay, but um, at this point, you've actually got the second uh, load coming in. Okay, and that's going to occupy the washer and the dryer. And then after that, you're going to have another set of laundry coming in. Okay, so the output over here will not really get a chance to go back into the washing cycle. Okay, so in other words, if there's some dependency, some interconnection between these two, and we'll see a more realistic example of that when you look at data, okay? So let's take a look at two possible problems that could come in, and they're sort of related to some of the issues that uh, you guys have mentioned. So let's take this example. What if the cycles are of different duration? So let's say if the drying cycle is 40 minutes long, and the washing cycle is 20 minutes, and the folding cycle is only 10 minutes, okay? People who've dry, done the laundry know that they're not all the same duration. So what would happen now? So you're going through the cycle, you put the first uh, laundry in here, and it takes 20 minutes, okay? Then you finish this, you put this into the dryer, it takes 40 minutes, right? And then you put this into the folding section, which takes 10 minutes. But at this time, you also want to put in another load into the washer. But this is taking 20 minutes and this is taking 40 minutes. Now what do we do? Do we have an issue here? Are we going to make all these cycles of different duration or do they all have to be of the same duration? Any thoughts? Sir, even if they are of different durations, yeah. the throughput will still be less than the latency. So we can still utilize them. Okay, so this is getting a little complicated. So over here, the latency seems to be 20, 40, and 10, 40, 50, 60, and 70 minutes, right? But the problem, the fundamental problem is that over here, when you put this, uh, the second laundry into the washer, um, you can't really move this over here unless these two, these durations are all the same, okay? So if you think about it a little bit longer, you'll realize that you have to make each one of them as long as the longest duration. So this will have to be 40 minutes. This will also have to be 40 minutes and so on. Maybe not the first cycle, but each one of them subsequently will have to be 40 minutes because there's one of them is going to be dry using the dryer, okay? And that's going to be the bottleneck. So you can't put the washer into the dryer until this is completed, okay? So this guy will have to actually wait for a total of 40 minutes, okay? So it's sort of like saying that the weakest link of a chain is the, is the, 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 the cha a chain is as strong as its weakest link. So this is uh, sort of saying that the, uh, each one of these cycles is, has to be at least as long as the longest duration. Okay, so now if you think about it, if this is going to be 40 minutes, what is the throughput and latency going to be? 